<laughs> now, of course, you know, when I introduce you, I introduce you as the eldest son of, of Rick Wakeman. And and Rick Wakeman, to all of us out here, uh, is just a godlike figure in progressive rock music, uh, keyboard music. Uh, being the son of Rick Wakeman, have you found it difficulty to be Oliver Wakeman, you know, to, to find your own identity? Has that ever been a difficult thing? Um, <clears throat> I think it's probably got two or three different stages in it. When you're a kid growing up, you're 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 kind of quite dwarfed by it, you know, because it is just all encompassing. Um, but I also, when I grew up, it was through a period of time in which Dad wasn't really. Um, I'm not going to say he wasn't famous, but he wasn't in vogue. He wasn't the whole. <clears throat> I have to phrase this correctly. <laughs> the nostalgia tours for bands didn't exist. I said in an interview the other day, I said nostalgia didn't exist, and that's rubbish because nostalgia has always existed. It's just that the music tours hadn't come around to being that thing where older bands went out on regular things and people wanted to go and see them you know music was changing throughout the 90s and he was just playing to his you know his his core fan base right. and doing tours and making it and you know making it's been making it a living and, and um but i remember sort of seeing him do lots of things and so i sort of was aware that he was well known um but of course there wasn't the internet there wasn't all these things where you could see him everywhere he, we had three tv channels in the uk uh, he might occasionally appear on the breakfast tv and that would be it you know so my awareness of his his fame really sort of came through knowing that he'd sold lots of records um <clears throat> so as i was growing up i was sort of aware of this and i went started to go and see a couple of yes shows and um i went on the abwh tour when i was about 16 i went around america with him mm -hmm. i remember seeing the size of the venue and going, okay, there's something going on here. And then people always talk to you and go, oh, you're Rick Sunday. And you go, yeah, yeah, great, great. And then he invited me along to some other things. He did some golf. He did some uh, charity golf things. And I remember once he was still out on the course. He was supposed to be giving out the prizes or, or some, some, some presentation he was going to do. I remember the organizer coming up to me and I was, I must have been 16, 16, 17. And um, he came up to me and he said, your dad's still on the golf course. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. And he said, um, he's supposed to be giving out the prizes. And I went, okay. He said, well, he's not, he's not back in time and he's not going to get back. Could you give them out? And I said, why? He said, well, because you're Rick's son. And I said, well, what does that mean? Why does that, why, why, why does that make me somebody that is, is important enough to give something out to congratulate somebody else for some work they've done? Because it's not, I'm not there on my behalf. I'm, I'm, you know, you're asking me to sub. It felt a bit odd to me, right. and it made me realise that actually, if I'm if I want to do something that that not takes me makes me different to dad, but make, gives me a chance of my own identity, I have to do something, and it has to be me, and I have to. Do, and for example, my dad and I have never played to well, we have played together on stage, but we didn't play together on stage until about maybe yeah. fifteen years into my career, right. and that was done deliberately because I didn't want to do it until I felt that I had sort of earned my stripes and created a bit of my own fan base or my own respected people that liked what I did and would actually go oh Oliver's playing with Rick that sounds a cool thing to go and see not just Rick's on stage with his son that was right. it was it was it was important to me to, to be like that and, and maybe nobody else thinks like that but for me as a musician that was important to me that was massively important that I felt right so I sort of went through being a kid not really knowing about it growing up I had to you know be myself and do what I do and then people go well that's a really interesting melt and then later on in life when I got to join Yes and the Straubs I think that the nice thing was is that I was sort of thought well being Rick's son maybe opened the door or made people aware of me but just the name doesn't keep the door open if I got up on stage and hit every single note wrong and was an annoying person and people didn't enjoy working with me the door would close pretty quickly after that so, <laughs> so you sort of realize that you know you so I was always very proud of the fact that the, 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 the job offers from yes and from the straws actually came to me I never courted that work mm -hmm. I never said to them oh if you have any big keyboard player give me a call you know it was it was I just never did that I'd worked with Steve how we'd become friends and he phoned me up out of the blue one day and just said i'm going to ask you a question and i want you to think about it and that's that's when i joined yes and the same thing happened with straws they said well look, we know you're on tour with yes but we would really like a keyboard player we want to go out and play some of the more complicated stuff that we did with the straws that we haven't been able to do because we haven't had keyboard players um who play in that sort of style uh, would you like to join and and so that to me was real that sort of epitomized everything that i'd looked for which was i'd actually um had a reputation that people knew that they could trust me to do a job yeah and, and so that's when I sort of really started to feel that I actually had my own identity. Uh, so a very long winded answer again, I'm afraid, but it does explain that feeling of tr trying to come out of a shadow and create your own identity whilst doing a similar sort of thing to, to, to the persons whose shadow you're trying to get out of. Yeah. And you've done incredible things uh, as Oliver Wakeman 
you know, you are just an incredible player. Uh, and I think about that and, and, you know, it's, it just seems like it's in the blood kind of thing. Steve was quite uh, instrumental in pulling that album together because we had met each other on the ABWH tour. I, I'd known Steve since I was a kid, but as a kid of his bandmate, you know, he was like, oh, hello, Oliver, how are you? You know, you're four toddling around the place, <laughs> right. fall, falling off a bicycle. They're great. <laughs> but when I got into my 20s and, and when I was 16, 17, and we went around tour with ABWH, they, um, Tony Levin got ill and the, the tour stopped. And so they decided to go into the studio to record the single version of the track I'm Alive, which was from the ABWH album, which is a slightly different arrangement to the record version because it was a one track off of a four track suite. So they needed to make it sound like an individual track and I remember going into the studio and Steve was there and he had his I think it was a Steinberger guitar the little headless headless guitar with a very small body and he was doing all the guitars on that and we just got talking and spent a lot of time just chatting and talking and you know, I really enjoyed his company. Uh, I don't distinctly remember in the same studio, Dylan's Dylan House, Steve's son, the drummer, was there talking to Bill Bruford and learning jazz drums. And I remember looking, thinking, this, this is really weird. Dad's not even here. I'm talking to the guitarist and the guitarist's son is talking to the drummer. <laughs> this is a really, really weird scenario. <laughs> anyway, Steve and I got friendly and, you know, that was that it sort of finished at that. And then one day, this is a, this is a really bizarre story. I'd released my first, uh, I, I, that was it. I was hitchhiking around the UK and I ended up at a train station where a friend of mine had given me a train ticket that had got me part way to go to see my mum and I was going to hitchhike the rest of the way. And I got off the train and on the platform was Steve Howe waiting to pick up his son. <laughs> and I walked over and I hadn't seen him for like 10 years. And I went over and said, hi, Steve, it's Oliver, Rick's son. And he was like, what are you, what are you doing here? I said, I'm going to see my mum. And it turned out they didn't, they lived like 20 miles away from each other. And so he gave me a lift part of the, part of the way there. And he said, oh, here's my number. You must give me a call at some point wow. and then I started working in a radio station and so I interviewed him for the radio station he invited me over to his house and then we, we suddenly ended up becoming buddies and I would go over and chat to him and he'd talk to me about his latest records and we listened to music together uh, and then one day I bumped into him in the local town and I just released my first record and somehow I, I he caught me just at the point I was outside the record shop and I was stood fortuitously right in front of the poster of my record that was in the record shop window. And he said, <laughs> what have you been up to? And I went, oh, this. And he went, oh, great. So I went in and got him a copy and gave him a copy. And he said, oh, I'll have a good listen. I'll give you a call. And I thought, yeah, you won't because you're, you're just being polite. You're not going to listen to the record. You're going to put it on your shelf. And uh, But a week later, he phoned me up and he said, um, you got some time? I said, yeah. He said, I'd like to talk to you about your record and go through it with you. And I was like, really? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, so track one, I really like the use of this and that and he talked me wow. through each track and i thought that was that was really nice he said look yes. come over, keep coming over and seeing me and so i'd go over and he'd say do you want to play me anything else do you want to play me other bits and pieces uh, that you've done and i would go over and take him bits and pieces that i was working on and he would go that's a really nice piece you've got really something special there or actually that piece you just played me there doesn't really fit with the last few pieces you played me if you're going to keep something together i would keep those three and eventually over these wow. these sort of like evening chats that we would have in his old farmhouse um, which was incidentally the farmhouse that they were, they did all the rehearsals for the Yes album in many years ago. So it's a lovely historical place to go. Um, and so the music, to answer your question, which is about do I play differently for these people? It's more that the music, I didn't play deliberately. It was just that the music that he felt joined together was music that he felt he connected with and so when we when it got to a certain point with the record he said to me you know because originally he said oh, well let's do a record together at some point and he was so busy with the s and so busy doing his solo stuff and he said to me one day he said look I, I just can't commit to doing a record with you because i'm just not going to have the time and i said oh that's a shame and he said but i think what you've got coming together here is a basis of a really good record he said and i would like to be an executive producer on it he said i would like to help you oversee the record he said not be a producer that sits in the studio and says right this type of drum sound i think you want to do this i want theirs we'll get these people in he said i want to sit sort of above that and advise on the feel and the theme and help you get the best out of yourself for this record and i said lovely and he said and if i see a spot that i think needs a bit of guitar i'll add a bit of guitar to it and i said well you know that's terrific i can't ask for more than that and as this went on he ended up playing on more and more and more of the record <laughs> and ended up on i think 11 of the 13 tracks he plays on um 
and became very integral to the whole sound of the record. And then, you know, so he would say to me, like, I'd, I'd maybe do a, a keyboard solo, and he'd say, too early for a solo there. And I'd say, well, what do you mean? He'd say, no, we need to build that song more. We need to define the themes. We need to get the audience with us and bought into the music by that point before you start taking them on an improvisation area. Mm-hmm. And, and so he didn't change my playing style, but he changed the delivery of how the piece of music would come. Uh, you know, and occasionally we disagreed, and I'd say, actually, no, I don't agree that that should go around three times. I think two times is right, and maybe that guitar line you've put in there doesn't quite work. And so that album came around very organically that way, uh, almost almost how I imagine 70s albums were done. You know, there was it wasn't sitting in the studio. It wasn't sat at Pro Tools, moving things around and, right. and tidying everything up. It was, and you know, one of the pieces, The Forgotten King, came about because he said to me once, um, he said, come over tonight, come play me some latest stuff. I put a cassette together of all the bits and pieces. This was you know, obviously 2001, 2000, year 2000. So mm-hmm. this was sort of like, um, you know, pre-CDs even, of burning CDs. So a cassette and I put it on my sideboard at home and I had the piano in the car and my electric piano was in the car because I think I was doing a show the next day and I'd loaded up the car in advance and I drove out to his house and he said brilliant come in have a cup of tea and, like and he said where you got the cassette of the music and I went yeah it's on the sideboard at home and I'd forgotten it and he said oh I said I said it's really annoying because I wanted to play you a particular piano piece he went oh that's a shame he said did I see the piano in your car though I went yeah he said oh bring that out plug it in and play it to me and it was like okay so I'm going to play you a piece I haven't actually played live or anything. <laughs> <laughs> else before and I remember dragging the piano in and going okay it's this sort of thing and I played it to him and he went do that again do that bit again and he walked into his back room came out with this beautiful classical guitar and we just started jamming and that piece was the piece that probably for me defined the album because it was so utterly organic it was arranged and written in his room in the house that they arranged the yes album and it was like uh. That's lovely. And so that was quite a moment. And that, to me, has always defined that album in the writing of it. Whereas when we moved on to working with Gordon, when I was with Yes, and it was like, that's great. And from the turn of a card was a, a, another different writing track that was written on Benoit David's guitar when we were on tour with Yes. He went, when we were recording the Yes album that became From a Page, we were all in Los Angeles writing. And Benoit and I shared an apartment while we were over there because uh, we were going to the studio every day. And um, we both the new boys in the band so um, both our wives were back in different countries and we thought it's all right we'll, we'll share an apartment and hang out together and, and Ben Walk can teach me how to cook because I'm a dreadful cook <laughs> and um as my wife will also <laughs> back up massively. Um, and it, one day he, he said, oh, I'm going back to Canada for a week. We're having a week off. He said, I'm going back to Canada and see my kids and my, my wife. And But the trouble is for me and Steve Howe is that we, you know, our families were in England and it was too far to go all the way back to the UK. It would take a day or so to travel there, a day or so to get over the jet, lag, a two days at home before you have to do the whole thing again and then come back to work. So we said, we'll stay. And Benoit left his guitar behind. And I just started writing this song about um, somebody who talked to me about card readings and I just wrote this little piece about card readings and then I played it to the rest of the band and I played it on a guitar to them and they was like oh this is great yeah we've got to do this song on the record and of course when I left the band it didn't happen right. and then it ended up on the Ravens and Lullabies album and actually coincidentally it then ended up back on the from a page record as well so 